Good morning, everybody. We've just been singing, Speak, O Lord, to your truth. And it's actually a lot of encapsulation of what was in Philippians chapter 1, in those few verses that David uh, read to us. So um, we're going to pray, and I'm just going to read that section again to remind us what it is that we're looking at this morning. So, Father, we ask that your word will speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Philippians 1, verses 27 to 30. Keep it open because I'll be talking about it this morning. It says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you were going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And the paragraph is this last part of, of chapter 1. And before this, Paul had been saying that he's in chains for Christ. And James, who's not really well today, he was going to be preaching on that section. So he will do that next time. So we're a little bit out of kilter. But what he'd been saying was that whatever happened to him, because he was in prison, he was writing from a prison cell, he'd been chained up, he was difficult, it was a difficult situation for him. He says, well, whatever happened was in God's plan for him, And actually was the best thing that could have happened because the gospel, the good news, was being preached even more and reaching people who Paul would not normally have been able to have the opportunity to share the gospel with. He says that he doesn't know whether he will live or whether he will die. But he knows that whatever happens, it will be for the best. And verse 21 says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, actually, in the original Greek, there is no isers. His exclamation is, for me to live, Christ, and to die, gain. And the gospel is what he says, whatever happens to me, whether I live or die, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. So what's this gospel that we need to conduct ourselves in? Well, the gospel is the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's the greatest announcement that this world has ever heard. It's the glad tidings that this fallen human race may found salvation from the wrath of God because of the sinless life and substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Jesus obtained perfect righteousness by living the perfect life that we could never live, however hard you try. And further, he purchased our pardon from sin by his death upon the cross through the shedding of his blood and the giving of his life and by this sin bearing substitutionary act Jesus redeemed all those who he came to save and forgiveness of sin is offered to all as a free gift that is received by faith alone apart from any good works it's not what we do it's what we trust in for our life And for those who receive this gospel, even though it's a free gift, it always comes at a cost, sometimes at a high price. So when anyone believes in Jesus Christ and receives his righteousness and the forgiveness of sin, this act of saving grace actually requires deep soul-searching, radical self-denial. And this step of faith necessitates a supreme commitment to the lordship of Jesus Christ. For those who embrace the gospel, it will actually cost them everything, even though it's free. It requires a willingness to suffer the opposition of Satan and the persecution of the world. And every true believer must be willing to endure reproach, ridicule, rejection. And a follower of Jesus must recognise that they, everything that they have belongs to their master. You know, I've had conversations with people saying, how much should we put aside each week to to give to the church? And you say, well, whose is it? It's all from God. And we need to be willing to do whatever 
God wants us to do because we're only custodians of whatever we have. And then people who come to know Jesus must be willing to relinquish their earthly popularity, the pleasures and possessions, and a disciple must be willing to receive all sorts of things in, in, in exchange for that, slander, shame, suffering for the gospel. And that's the high cost of discipleship, and its price is never marked down. You don't get a bargain price one. When you become part of the family of God, it comes as a package. You don't very often hear people preach this. Most of the time, it's come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. But this morning, I'm going to tell you, if you come to Jesus, all your problems will start. But you'll get the strength to go through what he wants you to do. So although the gospel is good news, it's never an easy message to live. And followers of Jesus can't expect better treatment in the world than Jesus himself received. Upon the cross, the Lord Jesus paid the supreme price for the salvation he purchased. In a similar manner, those who are born of the Spirit must carry their cross and sacrifice all they are and have for the gospel. And this is the reality of believing the good news of Jesus Christ. And it necessitates dying to self in order to live in obedience to Christ. And that's what Paul was saying. He was cheering the Philippians up. Maybe not. But he was given a message which says the gospel is worthy of being lived against. Conduct yourself in a worthy way. And Paul begins by telling the Philippians that whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. They must conduct themselves in a way that honours the gospel. And because of that, they must live distinctly and differently to the people around them of the world. They must model the message that they've now embraced. They enter the kingdom with the surrender of their life to Jesus. And this is precisely how they must live out the reality of their faith. And to live in a manner worthy of the gospel is an expression which summarises all that is required in Christian living. Included in this statement is every teaching and every command in the Bible relevant for New Testament believers. And the word, and it was interesting that Keith uh, no, uh, David read it talking about a citizenship because that's what that word embraces it says means to live as a citizen of a country in a law abiding manner to conduct yourself and Paul is here reminding the Philippians of their dual citizenship you know some people have two passports don't they they have a, this passport and a, and a British passport and they use it depending on where they're flying to and all, all the rest of it. Um, but we have two passports. And the Philippians were special because they understood that. You see, Philippi was a Roman colony. And so they had some special treatment. But they also knew that they belonged to the citizenship of heaven. And so they had a dual passport. And Paul was saying, conduct yourself worthy of being a citizen. They were 800 miles from Rome, and even further from heaven, but they were citizens of both. And depending on which passport you want to use, is the one that you most agree and have affinity to. And we can use our Philippians passport, or our southern passport, as it were, or we can use our heavenly passport. We're citizens of both. And the implication is that how we live must be consistent with what we believe. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. And a disciple of Christ is responsible for conducting themselves in a way that matches and showcases the gospel that they believe. And we must never become passive in pursuing holiness. We must walk in a godly manner of life. Just as Psalm 1 says that we are to walk in the paths of righteousness, not in the way of sinners. And are you a citizen of the kingdom of God, a believer in Christ? And if so, this command is directed to you. We must live worthy of that calling. And the Philippians must live consistently with the gospel. So that whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, I'm expecting you to live as though I was with you. And Paul says this, I don't think he ever went back to Philippi because he was in a, in a Roman prison, uh, and we don't read that he returned. But he knows that whether he's with them or he's not with them, 
God is with them all the time. He is always present in every way. And Paul makes it clear that his present absence from them didn't allow them to become lax in their Christian living. Live as though Jesus was next to you. You, Years ago, they used to have a little bracelet that people come on here. What would Jesus do? And you ask the question, well, if Jesus was with me, what would he do? Well, Jesus is with you all the time. And they could not use his separation from them stuck in Rome as a prisoner as an excuse for their spiritual lives to become less than what they could be or should be. And God is with us. And through the Holy Spirit, he lives in us and dwells within us. That's a great privilege, isn't it? And yet sometimes we forget that. We still want to live in our own way. But does it really matter how we live? Surely it doesn't really matter, does it? Well, it matters to God how we live our lives. It matters to Jesus how we live our lives. And grace, which is a free acceptance of what Jesus has done for us, isn't just a passive thing. It's a, an active way of living and grace is the power to be what God wants you to be and to do what God wants you to do he doesn't leave you to you know muddle along on your own he gives you the Holy Spirit and he gives you grace the power to be what God wants you to be and to do what God wants you to do and obedience to the word is never optional for the Christian but that obedience doesn't come from a slavish, ooh, it comes from the love that we have for Christ. We want to please him. We want to have a look at him. We want to do what is the right thing. And so, to finish off what Paul is saying, he says how this submissive attitude, how this walking in a way which is conducive to being a Christian, to the gospel, how does that work out? How do we do that? And what's the consequences of it? And that's the next little bit of the passage. And Paul says that first of all, we must stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Standing firm means to be fixed in stationary position, almost like a sumo wrestler. You know those great big chaps that you see? They stand one side of each other and they plant their feet... And the idea is to get the other one to push them out of the thing. But they stand firm. And the idea is not to be pushed or moved around by another force, but to be anchored in one place. And actually, the term that Paul uses, the word stico, is a military term that pictures a a soldier holding his position on the front line of battle. You know, when the Romans fought, they had rows of rows of people. And the, the soldiers would stand next to each other, firm. They would have their shields linked together with a little gap for their swords to go out. And the amazing thing is with the Romans, if a man is down, the next man behind steps into the breach. And that's what he's saying to the Philippians. Stay together. Stand together. In like manner, the believer must stand in the face of spiritual opposition, helping each other, strengthening each other. I don't know whether you know about the fire ants of Texas. The fire ants of Texas. They're called fire ants because if you get bit by one, it feels as though you're on fire. Alan knows about it. He's probably been bit by one, have you? One is more than enough. Yes. (laughs) But they have a remarkable strategy for what happens because where they live in Texas I mean they're all all over the world as well we've seen them in in South America and what have you but in Texas they get flash floods and what happens is that their nests get flooded and within a couple of seconds of the water coming upon them they do an amazing thing each of them in their mouths grabs an, an arm or a leg one of the legs of the others and very quickly they create a raft all connected together. And that raft can float on the top of the water. And so it moves around until the water recedes, and then it goes back and they build another nest. 
And when they're building a nest, they will often, as they're building it along the outside, they will stand on each other's shoulders to fill the nest in. And that's just exactly how we should be. Not that we should bite each other's legs, <laughs> but that we should stick together. We should work next to each other, stand side by side. And this summons applies to every believer today. Every member in the body of Christ must stand together in the apostles' teaching. And we should stand together in and for the truth of the word. But it's not just standing together, it's striving together. That word striving in Greek is unathleo. Athleo. It's the word we get an athlete or athletic from. And the idea pictures someone competing with maximum effort in an athletic contest, such as running or wrestling. And the the Philippians must contend together in their witness for Christ in the face of much opposition. They must contend together for the Christian faith. They must put a maximum amount of energy into it. They must fight together against the world. Not just stand, but also go forward and fight. And the result of that is that they become sanctified together. Thirdly, Paul adds that his readers should not be frightened of their opponents. Who were these opponents? Well, within the church in Philippi, there were people who were coming saying that that just believing in Jesus isn't good enough. They've got to adhere to the Mosaic law. They've got to do this and do that and do the other, and they mustn't do this and they mustn't do that from there. And their joy was being diminished. They were getting confused. And Paul says, we must be sanctified together. This is a sign that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. If we stand and if we strive, we will be sanctified together. And Jesus said to all of us, not just the Philippians, not just for his disciples, but to every one of us, he said this, and it's a promise. We don't often pick this promise out, But it says this, in the world you will have tribulation. That's John 16, verse 33. And this was affirmed by Paul. Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. Likewise, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal amongst you, as though some strange thing is happening to you. Neither should the Philippians be surprised or alarmed by this opposition. And the spiritual adversity that the Philippians are facing in their fight for the, for the faith is a confirming sign. If you aren't facing opposition, you're part of the opposition. If you are facing opposition, it's because you are part of the kingdom of God. And that's a sign that we know that we are born again. If we are facing spiritual problems... And then Paul goes on to say, not only are we sanctified together, not only do we become holy together and righteous, and that word sanctified there, or saved, it actually means to become righteous in terms of the term that God has when he sees us. He says, not only that, he says, but you've been specially selected, along with every other Christian, to suffer for Jesus. It says, for to you... It has been granted for Christ's sake to suffer for him. To all who are given saving faith, God also appoints them to suffer for his sake. These two gifts, salvation and suffering, are inseparably bound together. The suffering was for the sake of the gospel. It included every believer in the church of Philippi, not just all the, you know, the leaders, but all who receive salvation will also have Suffering. See, I thought I'd cheer you up this morning. (laughs) It's a message of... (laughs) Well, it's a true message. But the suffering isn't suffering if we know that we're doing it for Christ. It's a joy. And all the believers in Philippi have been granted saving faith as as well as the privilege of suffering for Christ. And the truth sounds strange to the world, but actually it does no strange to genuine believers. Jesus himself suffered to purchase salvation at the cost of his own life. He said that the slave cannot expect better treatment than his master. And if people hated Christ, they will hate his disciples. If they persecuted Christ, 
they will persecute all who believe in him. And to suffer for Christ, as to be saved by Christ, is actually a blessing. So when you're going through a bad patch, well, it says rejoice. I haven't quite got to that stage yet. But I can accept that it's part of the process that is happening to me. And why do I know that? Because in John 15, Jesus said that if we abide in him, he will abide in us. And anything that is not quite right, he will prune out. And even the good bits, he will prune to make it stronger. Because he wants to make you the strongest person you can be. And sometimes that comes with pruning. And sometimes the pruning is through opposition and suffering. And then Paul says, finally, Paul concludes this paragraph by encouraging the believers. Because he's saying, you're encountering the same conflict which you saw in me. And the word conflict is actually agon. It's the word we use for agony. And it was a term representing the painful effort expended by athletes. So he's got a very kind of um, Olympic picture here. He said striving is the agony that comes with it. And the agony is there is the conflict that you saw in me. It was where the runners and the wrestlers and the boxers suffered the pain in competition. And athletes pushed themselves to the limit until their bodies were often black and blue. And actually later this word became the word for the marathon um, and also for the athletic uh, stadium that was there. And amid their godless culture, the Philippians are in a fight for the gospel. But our culture is no less godless than those in the Philippians. In fact, if anything, it's slightly more so these days. You know, we're no longer a Christian country. People no longer know about the word of God. In education, the word of God is not preached or, or taught. And people grow up knowing nothing about God. And yet Paul says we are there together, striving in one accord, conducting ourselves in the manner which is good for the gospel. And he reminds the Philippian Christians... The agony that you're going through, you saw in me. You know, when Paul came to Philippi on his second missionary journey, he brought the gospel to a very small gathering of women to begin with at the local riverside. And beginning with a lady called Lydia, who was a seller of purple, people were converted. And their conversions to Christ set off a firestorm of persecution. He set free a young lass. And there was riots, there was mobbing. Paul was arrested, he was beaten, he was imprisoned and put in stocks. That's pretty bad, isn't it? And then at midnight, what does he do? Well, him and Silas start to sing. And the earthquake came, and the jail was brought open, and then the Philippian jailer became part of the family of God. And the Philippians saw all this. They saw what had happened to Paul, and he's encouraging them. He's saying their suffering for the gospel puts him in good company with him. And four times in this first chapter, Paul talks about his imprisonment in Rome for the gospel. He points to the possibility of his death because of this message. He states he's ready to die for the truth. And at the end of his of the of the um, of the message to Philippians, chapter four, verse fourteen, he talks about the affliction that he have. And the Philippians had repeatedly, time after time after time, seen how Paul had had to suffer for the gospel. And Paul says, that's what is going to happen to you. But cheer up, because God is going to give you the strength to go through it. And the gospel is good news, but it's never easy news. It's a demanding call to repentance and faith that requires a full sacrifice from each one of us. You know, there was a man called John Chrysostom. He was a pastor in the, in the 14th century. And he was imprisoned for his faith. And he was brought before the Empress of Rome, who threatened him with banishment. And this is what he said. He says, you can't banish me, for this world is my father's house. Wherever you send me, I'll still be in my father's house. Okay, she said, I will kill you. He can't. For my life is hidden with Christ in God. Then I'll take away all your treasure. You can't do that either. For my treasure is in heaven 
And that's where my heart is. I'm going to drive you away from all your friends and you'll have no one left. No, you cannot, for I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you. There is nothing you can do to harm me. And that's biblical courage. That's standing up for what you believe in. And she thought he was weak, but she was strong. But it was actually the opposite. As she spoke to him, she realised that he was strong and she was the one who was weak. So how do we rate on Paul's list of how we conduct ourselves? Are we standing together? Are we striving together? Are we becoming a sign to those around us that something different is happening here? Are we suffering together? And are we struggling together? If we are, welcome (laughs) to the gospel. But let us live in a way which is conducive to the glory of God in our lives, wherever we are. Whether you're in Philippi or whether you're in Southam or your citizenship is in heaven. So the Lord bless you. Amen.